Well, when we talk about uh, President Lloyd Barber, we're actually talking about my own lived history. Most of the work I've done on the history of Regina, I've read documents in the archives about, have no personal knowledge of. But when I came to the university, Lloyd Barber was the president, so I kind of have that kind of information about him, in addition to the archival research I've done on that era. But it strikes me that it's easy to run a university when there's lots of money, and it's very hard to run a university when money is short. And what happened after the boom of the 60s and the early 70s is that suddenly money was very short. I was uh, vice president of the University of Saskatchewan, which meant both universities. So I had a great deal to do with splitting the budget between the two, with uh, personnel matters between the two, and I thought there were some great efficiencies in the relationship. But when it became inevitable that they were going to split, I resigned my position and stood down because I didn't want to be part of the process of the division. When uh, John Archer, who was the first president in Regina, stood down, I was asked to uh, put my name in for the presidency and became the second president and began the process of building an institution that uh, was badly lacking in many of the basic services which had previously been done. It was a long, long pull to uh, help create a new independent institution. People don't realize because of the difficult economic circumstances and because of the history of the two institutions how close the University of Regina was to uh, being wound down by people who thought it might not succeed. Fascinating when I, I learned later of uh, real concerns in the government that the University of Regina might not succeed. So I don't know how active the forces against it were, but uh, they were there. And we had no champions in the government because we had no graduates who were in either the bureaucracy or the on the political side. And we couldn't get anything built. We couldn't get any capital. The roof leaked and the phone didn't work. And it was hopeless. I had to put plastic bags on my desk to keep my papers from getting wet when it rained overnight. And we had to import parts for the phone system from Mexico because the phone system was so obsolete. The only place they had any parts left was Mexico. And we couldn't get any capital to do to fix that kind of stuff because maybe we weren't going to continue in existence. Those were not easy times, I tell you. I think he himself used to say, well, I'm a builder. <laughs> and I, there is truth to that, because even when money was short, he reallocated funds to start new programs. Saskatchewan Indian Federated College, journalism. And so that the university kept growing. It didn't lose its sort of forward momentum. It would have been easy to sort of cave and despair at that point. Because we live in a sort of a boom and bust world in Saskatchewan. And you have to have the long view to see that if things are a little bit tough, it's no time to sort of start tearing things down. You have to keep on going in the confidence that things will improve, as they did eventually. One of the achievements of uh, President Barber was that he took us through those years without a, d a diminution of confidence. Again, I think personality comes into play. I also think his basic instincts were almost always right in terms of what really matters in a university, you know, what the underlying values of liberal education are. That is to say, respect for the truth, respect for other people's point of view, civil dialogue, even if you don't agree with what another scholar is saying, you have to treat them decently. And similarly, even if you don't agree with what a student is saying, you have to respect that they are an individual, they have the right to their opinion. I think that's a core value of university education, and I always felt that uh, President Barber was on, always on the right side of that issue. Mankind has a 
an innate curiosity to find out how and why. And universities have been institutions that have been somewhat apart from the society where people were given the privilege of searching for how and why.